I have a long and bizarre history with the Naruto franchise. In many ways, it is one of my favorite long-running battle shonen with some of the most compelling characters and narrative throughlines. But at the same time, it also has some of the lowest lows with bizarre narrative decisions that will never make any sense to me. Its successor Boruto Naruto Next Generations has been on air and on paper for several years at this point, and throughout that time it has garnered a reputation that is all over the place to say the very least. Rather than fall back on hyperbolic, this is amazing or this is terrible rhetoric, I want to take a deep dive arc by arc and look at what works, what doesn't, and whether it's even worth diving into in the first place. We have a lot to cover, and to be honest, I probably could have done with some shadow clones to help make this, but you know what shadow I do have? Rage Shadow Legends, who have kindly sponsored this video. You, you see what I did there? Okay, well, look, listen. If this is somehow your first time on the internet and you don't know what Rage Shadow Legends is, despite the million plus people playing it every day, it is one of the most widely played turn-based RPGs around, combining the progression elements of classic dungeon crawlers with the class variety and gameplay options of an MMO. You collect champions with various skills that each have their own benefits and downsides depending on the enemies you're facing. To succeed, you need to take the sad pancake of a butt and level it up with fancy gear before taking other butts and building a team that best suits the scenario. Once you've assembled the mightiest team of waifu, you can challenge other players, take on bosses, play through the campaign, or take on daily challenges. You can play wherever you want to, whether you're alone or with friends, and it's on both PC and mobile, it's cross-play, so no matter where you are, you and your weeaboo army can play and your progress will carry over. These types of games are incredibly intimidating, particularly from the mobile platform, but Raid Shadow Legends is surprisingly easy to get into. It has a fully voiced tutorial to get you started on the basics, and if you're looking to get deep into the nuances of the gameplay, there are countless communities like Reddit, Discord, Twitch, or even just the endless guides posted on YouTube every single week to help you along the way. It is a whole bunch of fun, so head down to the description to grab the game and get yourself 100,000 silver coins and a big beefy boy Jotun, one of the epic champions in the game. And with that said, let's dive back into Boruto. For some context, I first got into the series in 2013 with the anime, and I think I must have watched up until the start of the search for Tsunade arc, at which point I think because of university work I fell off of the series and wouldn't jump back in until 2016 where I ended up reading the manga from the start through to around mid pain arc, where I then fell off again due to a mix of burnout and not massively caring about the new direction the series was going in post Orochimaru. Then, at the end of 2019, I finally got through Shippuden the anime, watched all the movies other than Boruto, and that leads us to where we are now. I have watched the Boruto anime and read the manga up to the most recent episode and chapter, and of course watched the movie and OVAs that came before. With Naruto Part 1, I loved pretty much everything. I think it is wholeheartedly one of the best battles shown in a round. My favourite arcs were the Chunin exams and the Konoha Crush arc, and I think the initial Sasuke vs Naruto fight to mark the end of Part 1 is one of the most compelling and masterfully composed battles in the genre. With Shippuden, I think things are extraordinarily messy, but largely still enjoyable. In isolation, each section is actually quite good, but I do think up until the pain arc, it also feels very disjointed and unsure of itself. You then head into the war arc, and it's just a big, unfocused mess, and the shining light of this section, Madara, one of the most well-realized villains of all time, is cast aside for Kaguya and a lot of Sage of Six Paths lore. While I don't hate that lore like a lot of fans do, I was very frustrated by that decision involving Madara. It felt like hundreds of episodes, hundreds of chapters of build-up for this incredible villain were thrown aside for someone who is barely even a character. Of course, the final battle is fantastic and the ending is very sweet, but I was definitely ready for something fresh and excited for Boruto. Academy Entrance Arc Kicking things off, I loved that the show really goes out of its way to hammer home that this is Boruto the show and not just Naruto Part 3. It focuses almost entirely on new characters with the old cast either not shown at all or relegated to very short moments. And in fact, I think the only real presence of older characters has been on people who didn't get much screen time in the original, in this case Shino and Konohamaru. The former of which gets some of the most amazing character development that really puts his writing in the original to shame. In only a few episodes, I feel like I have great insight into who each person is, and it's nice that they're so different from their parents, with maybe the exception of Shikadai at this point, who may as well be baby Shikamaru. Boruto himself is so much like his father, but also nothing like his father. He's kind of like Kid Trunks in a way, supremely arrogant due to how easily things come to him, but unlike Kid Trunks, there's actually some depth to that. It makes him flawed, and the way they turn living in the shadow of Naruto into a consistent plot point is quite the sweet and compelling through line. He seems so dead set on carving out his own path, and a lot of his goals are largely in opposition to what pushed Naruto forwards in the original series. I love these characters, and that's a great thumbs up from me for the intro to this series. But the plot in this first arc is quite underwhelming. 
I have loved the Slice of Life focus. It is a breath of fresh air after the very dark and grandiose final arc of Naruto, and it sets up a different tone for the show alongside its new characters. That said, given the genre, there does need to be an underlying narrative through line, something that pushes the story forwards, and the mystery of the ghosts appearing around the village felt a bit underwhelming and drawn out. When the revelation comes around, it sort of feels like things went from 0 to 100 in about 3 seconds, and despite the rest of the series going, this is not Naruto, this ending is very Naruto for a number of reasons. Firstly, it hinges heavily on Naruto remnants, the Hashirama cell, the Foundation, Danzo, none of which feels all that relevant to any of the new central characters. It's appealing almost entirely to the audience and their memories, and I don't think that makes for a compelling or internally consistent story. It likewise ends with a shoehorn tragic backstory and a talk no jutsu finale, which although a staple of the franchise, feels very at odds with the rest of the show that's been distancing itself from the old formulas. At the very least, I enjoyed the contrast of Sumire carrying out her father's legacy, along with what is essentially Boruto's rejection of his own father. It was also tied in nicely with Mitsuki's own path of self-discovery, particularly the scene in the hospital where he talks to Sumire about Boruto. There's fantastic character work going on here, but the plot is just not matching up to that. I'm glad to see some sort of resolution for Sumire towards the end, even if it is kind of just hand-waving her actions away and pretending nothing happened. That's not particularly fulfilling, but I'm glad she wasn't just entirely forgotten about. I will say this is followed up by some fun Denki-focused stuff, and I did really adore the episode focused on Naruto's inauguration day. That is such a great bit of insight into how Boruto's perception of his father changed from when he was younger, and contrasting it against the present storyline is super effective. All the scenes at Ichiraku are just perfect. Himawari's Byakugan Awakening is both hilarious and intriguing, and although I do miss Iruka's speech from the original OVA version, this is still a huge highlight in this first batch of episodes. Sarada Uchiha Arc up until this point, Sarada's been nothing more than a side character, which I found really strange given her presence in marketing material and the opening, so bringing her to the forefront like this with arguably even more depth than Boruto's initial characterization was pretty refreshing, particularly with how ballsy it is to just cut him out of the story here. I didn't learn until after I'd finished watching this section that this arc was adapted from something Kishimoto had written, but I think that explains a whole lot about this arc's content. The character writing and connection to the original series jumps up in quality tenfold, and although of course I praised the earlier content for feeling like Boruto and not Naruto Part 3, I think this strikes a solid balance in that it continues to develop older characters and new ones simultaneously. Given the hints to Kaguya-related content in various cutaways so far, my hope at this point was that it would continue to be a thing. The core aspect of this arc is Sorida, obviously, and I found the focus on her inner demons to be remarkably captivating and well fleshed out. Likewise, getting insight into Sakura's own struggles with loneliness and learning to be a parent was just fantastic. I absolutely adored all of the character writing here, particularly Sasuke's own troubles with his desire for atonement for what he did in the original series, and how that sits at odds with being a father. He's never around, so while he's succeeding down one path, he's creating failings in another. The arc's shortcomings are that it's short. At only five episodes in length, it has no time to really develop any of the conflict. Shin appears out of nowhere, his motivations are trite, and although he's linked to previously established content, simply throwing Orochimaru in to dump a bunch of backstory doesn't really solve any of that. Shin entirely exists to be a symbolic vessel of parenthood to contrast against Sarada and Sakura's storyline. It's not that different to how Sumire's plotline functioned, and while that's cool, it doesn't work as a competent narrative beyond that. I think that's my issue with the show so far at this point. It has a hell of a lot of fantastic moments, but they don't form a cohesive narrative. In many ways, that reminds me a whole lot of Dragon Ball Super's structure. It's a whole bunch of pretty cool things in isolation, but as a whole, it's disjointed and doesn't fit together as a long-running story like the series it's originating from. School Trip Arc Unfortunately, much like the last arc, this is all wrapped up in a detrimentally short amount of time. Again. We were introduced to Kagura, the right-hand man of the Mizukage. He's a pretty interesting character, and I actually found his inner struggles quite compelling and reasonably well fleshed out. Although Yagura, the old Mizukage and Jinchuriki, wasn't even really a character in Naruto, and yet we're somehow expected to feel the weight of that lineage on Yagura's shoulders, I think it does mostly work. That seems to come as a result of the big emphasis on establishing the horrors of the old Miss Village under that Mizukage's rule, and it's neat how Kagura's own moral conflict also manifests in the narrative as a reflection of the Land of Waters, own desire for peace against the twinned water nation, the Land of Waves. 
This also extends to the villain, Shizuma, who holds the old days in high regard, rallying against peace. He's got a solid presence about him, which makes him a joy to watch, but I don't think he's all that well fleshed out due to the runtime of the arc. His motivations feel a little one-dimensional, and his connection to Kagura is nowhere near explored enough to make his switching of sides all that believable. Likewise, although the revival of the Seven Swordsmen is a nice idea, they have exactly zero depth, with the worst example being Buntan, whose attempt at depth is a flashback of her mother kicking a bucket over. That's it. That's the character. Thankfully, this series rarely falters in its action, and the finale was pretty great as a result. Buntan vs Sorida was definitely my favourite aspect of that, although I do think her mastery of Genjutsu being off-screen is kind of bizarre and a bit underwhelming. I thought her Sharingan unlock was also a bit sudden and subdued in the last arc, so it's kind of sad to see that that continues. I know it's not that interesting to watch characters go through the same training arcs again and again, but I think you need something to make these kind of things feel earned or important. On the other side of the action, Kagura and Boruto teaming up for the win was a very fulfilling way to round off the former's character arc, but with there being exactly zero denouement, zero rounding down of the arc and legitimate resolution of all plot threads, things end with a bit of a whimper with the arc's narrative threads just brushed under the rug and forgotten about. It once again makes the series feel so disjointed, even though the character through lines are pretty damn good. Also, if you found that really hard to follow, I don't blame you. There's Kagura, Yagura, Kaguya, or so many similar sounding names and my brain is melting out of my ears. Graduation Exam and Genin Mission Arc Heading into these arcs, there's a number of self-contained character-focused episodes. The first is on Inojin, and I think I must have some sort of intense connection to anything Yamanaka. I absolutely adore Inojin and his sassy little self, so to get an episode all about him and his own struggles and attitude issues was a nice surprise. It's also cool to see how Sai has become a pretty great dad, and considering where he came from in the original series, that's a pretty big deal. The next story is all about Boruto getting a souvenir for Himawari, which is another one of those life lesson episodes that are kind of everywhere in this show. They're typically sweet and effective at helping Boruto develop as a character, but I often think they're a bit of a mixed bag in terms of execution. With this one, I greatly enjoyed the honesty is the best policy lesson, since it lets its message speak for itself, it doesn't hit you over the head with it. That's how you do these kinds of things right, and unfortunately, jumping ahead a bit, there's a similar kind of lesson moment in the Genin mission arc that features Boruto having a nice introspective moment about a situation, only for Sarada to go, hey, you're having an introspective moment right now, as though the audience had not a single brain cell. It just feels very condescending towards the viewer. Though frankly, this arc, or couple of episodes really, is just generally very underwhelming. It suffers from the same issue that every arc so far has, it leaves no time to develop anything. The idea of neighbouring villages fighting over a deed for a bridge is a great idea, particularly when the severity of the situation now forces the new Team 7 to focus on their teamwork and humility as new shinobi. Unfortunately, there's no time to dig into Kiri's backstory, the matter of her father and her reaction to it, or the villagers' politics beyond the very surface, and that leaves the villains feeling as shallow as can be, and as a result, the arc just feels underwhelming on the whole. It's sad because the arc before it, the exam arc, is definitely the most complete arc of the series so far, and probably at this point my favourite next to Sarada's earlier on. It has two clear objectives, transition the characters into real shinobi and teach them exactly what that entails. It executes that idea perfectly. Boruto and the rest of the class are the most happy-go-lucky characters around, and that's not without reason. They grew up in a time of peace and they have absolutely zero concept of the old world. That's made them carefree, and in Boruto's case, arrogant and indifferent. Of course that's going to be frustrating to someone like Kakashi, and to see him set up a plan to make them not only work hard, but together is wonderful. In particular, the isolated scene between Kakashi and Boruto where he insists he break his own arm is one of the greatest scenes in the show so far in terms of power and meaning. To have that culminate with the group teaming up together, taking a moment to understand their flaws, and then overcoming them was magnificent. The show even acknowledges and overcomes its issue that, frankly, all of the old characters are too powerful, and it does that by having the new generation fail to take the bell from Kakashi, and that not mattering at all. That wasn't the point of the test, they understood the unity and succeeded because of that. It feels earned, it feels logical, and most importantly, it feels complete. I loved it wholeheartedly. Before moving on, I have to address another standalone episode, and it's an awkward one to talk about. Minsky finally gets some backstory, and it's fantastic, but it's out of nowhere, no lead in, no lead out, nothing. The audience knows he's related to Orochimaru and his gang at this point because of the drips of rather obvious information placed prior to this, but this episode just happens without any real tie to that. It's an amazing episode with some of the strongest animation of the series so far and an exceptionally compelling narrative with questions about identity and agency brought up and a new perspective on Orochimaru presented. 
but its placement feels bizarre, particularly when you have an awareness of its own arc that comes later in the show that deals with these same issues. As great as this episode is, don't get me wrong, this is a fantastic episode, I just feel like it should have come later and tied itself into the aforementioned arc about Mitsuki. Byakuya Gang Arc Never has an arc summed up the experience of the show more than this one. For one, it is not long enough. It is five episodes that should have been seven. Secondly, like almost every Boruto arc thus far, the bulk of the story is enjoyable, but it falls at the last hurdle. I love the concept of this arc. It cannot be overstated how much I adore everything about what this story is trying to say. The moral ambiguity of a Robin Hood type gang is such an amazing idea, particularly when you have one of those members befriend one of the main cast, breaking down the idea of your standard black and white good versus evil scenario. Ryogi is such a wonderfully realized character. His tragic backstory doesn't exist just for the Mafil's value, it's there to help you understand his dedication to Gecko and the cause. Likewise, his conversation conversations with Shikadai over the games of Shogi go a long way in developing his own internal moral struggles. Most critically, his presence serves to develop Shikadai himself, who thus far has just felt like a carbon copy of Shikamaru. Finally, we get a sense of what makes him unique, what his own flaws and strengths are, and his mentality towards the situation. He actually feels like his own character here, and I'm so glad that that remains the case going forwards. Unfortunately, while the shogi metaphor coming to fruition in the lead up to the finale is really fulfilling, the ending itself is agonizingly stupid. It is by far the most frustrated I have ever been with this show. It was immediately obvious from the very first time we saw Ryogi's backstory that Gekko was somehow related to his father's murder, but I held out hope that there were more layers to it so it wouldn't undo the moral conundrum this arc has hinged on so far. Of course, turns out Ryogi was under a genjutsu all this time and Gekko had murdered his parents before his very eyes. By itself, that isn't a terrible twist. It helps Ryogi come to the understanding that being a pawn is not a positive and sets up Boruto, Shikidai, and Ryogi to team up and take down Gekko. But of course, that isn't what happens. In what is one of the most mind-numbingly stupid turn of events, Naruto shows up out of nowhere to save the day and take down Gekko in an instant. He steals all of Ryogi and Shikadai's agency and kills the entire arc's purpose. This is all followed up by the series doing what it always does. Oh, the arc's over? Well, you want some falling action and resolution? Nope, it's all over. Moving on now, next arc. Don't talk about this anymore, thank you. It drives me insane. Tune in exams arc. I don't even really know where to begin. This is such an astonishing arc from start to finish and the level of writing I wanted since the very beginning of the show. It's a bit depressing that the most engaging arcs so far have all come from Kishimoto in some form, with the best one stemming from a movie, but I guess that's a point for another time. There are so many themes in this arc that it's actually quite intimidating to even try and tackle them. I suppose the first is about parenthood in the form of Naruto missing and messing up Boruto and Himawari's birthday and treating the former like a child. It's contrasted with Sasuke's approach and leads into the fantastic bond between him and Boruto in both their training segments and active role in the overall narrative. To see Naruto realize his failings as a father in the end was indescribably heartwarming. I mentioned it in the Sarada arc about Sakura, but it is so nice to see characters whose character arcs are for all intents and purposes done with actually continuing to be developed. On the other side of that is Boruto, who has zero concept of the weight his father holds in his shoulders. In fact, he has zero idea about who his father really is as a person. Through both his time with Sasuke and his eventual heart-to-heart -heart with his father, he finally gets an inkling of their similarities and ultimately gains the resolve he was lacking, one of the central themes of that earlier graduation arc. These dualities and thematic pairings are all over this arc, and probably most prevalent between Boruto and Momoshiki, and I suppose the Atsutsuki clan as a whole. Shortcuts to power is probably the most succinct way of putting it. Boruto, so desperate to gain his father's attention, takes up the scientific ninja tool and cheats his way to victory. He certainly gets his father's attention, but not even remotely in the way he wanted. That confrontation is such a tough watch, I don't think I've ever seen Naruto quite so mad and disappointed before, certainly not in quite the same manner at least. I think the issue with this shortcut to power theme isn't really the arc's fault, but more so the show's ordering of events. The behavior exhibited by Boruto here feels like pre-Genin mission Boruto, the supremely arrogant, attention-seeking child who thinks about nothing but himself. He's back. The show had kind of already developed him past that, but the events here undermine that development a little bit. It does largely still work, but I don't think it's quite as natural as I suppose it probably did watching it in isolation in movie form. The other jarring aspect is the characterization of the scientist who created the tool. 
For the entire series up until this arc begins, he's been a goofy, extraordinarily charming and caring sort of semi-father figure to Boruto, picking him up and giving him gifts and ultimately being a pretty positive influence on his life. Despite that, once this arc begins, he becomes this unhinged mad scientist type and it's very jarring. Of course, there's a big reason for this. The first is that in the original movie, he's a mad scientist anyway, and then the manga came along and retroactively revealed that Ao had put him under a genjutsu. That's included here in a very short scene, but it's never actually addressed, theorised about nothing. It's been a hundred episodes since this arc and it still hasn't been addressed. It's probably one of the best examples of how structuring arcs is very important. Either way, it's a small issue that doesn't actually harm the arc. The shortcut to power theme is well realised overall. Ultimately, Momoshiki's reliance on it means nothing. He's defeated by true, hard-earned power in the most emotional father-son Rasengan that would give Goku and Gohan's father-son Kamehameha a run for its money. Episode 65 straight up broke me emotionally. I've seen it before in isolation, given I did a whole video on its animation ages ago before Tokyo TV took it down. Thank you. But to see it in full context just elevated it to new heights. I was cheering, I was crying, and everything in between. On the villain front, I think there are some interesting nuances here. Momoshiki as a whole does largely work as a villain, though I don't think he's a particularly well fleshed out character in isolation. Although the series does a good job of prepping the viewer for his arrival through Sasuke's investigation of remnant Kaguya shrines prior to this arc, his motivations and the story as a whole are tied entirely to the old Kaguya plotlines outlined at the end of the original series. Were this a full stop marking the end of this plotline, I'd have been pretty intensely bothered by that, but leaving a hook pun intended in the form of Urashiki was satisfying as hell, particularly in combination with the huge plot bombs dropped by Momoshiki about both the eye Tonori gave Boruto and the newfound mark in his palm as we later come to know is called the Karma. For the first time in this show, nothing is brushed under the rug and forgotten about once an arc is over. All themes were bookended and everyone's agency felt intact. As a viewer, you get to move on with the following narrative beats in mind. What is that eye and what is this palm mark? What did Momoshiki's final words mean? Who controlled the scientist? What are Urashiki's plans? How will Boruto behave after this experience and what will his interactions with his father be like? How will the Shinki plotline develop in the future? What's going on with Tonori on the moon? There's so much to build a narrative off of and while we'll soon find out that a lot of that doesn't actually deliver, leaving these kind of hooks is precisely the kind of thing that thrusts the narrative forwards for an audience. That was easily the most competent thing in the show so far and felt right in line with the heights of Shippuden. A quick word on the movie version before moving on. Personally, I find it quite underwhelming in comparison to the TV version. All the key components are more or less still there, of course, but they don't hit nearly as hard as the TV version for me, since essentially every theme just feels severely underdeveloped in comparison, particularly Momoshiki. I think the only aspect I preferred was Boruto getting excited by his dad's praise and wriggling around on his bed. Other than that, it kind of just feels like the TV version with the development cut out to get to the action faster, and don't even get me started on that original Momoshiki design. Chocho -cho arc. I don't want to dwell on this. I don't think anyone genuinely loves this. The first episode is kind of cute, but three episodes of this stuff is far too much. The best thing I can say for me is that I greatly enjoyed the way Orochimaru's gender was treated and the weirdly body positive message for Chocho, which is quite rich coming from a show that bullies her all the time for her weight. But yeah, I think the less said about the main actress subplot with Psychomantis, the better. Before we get into the next arc, we do thankfully have a great Metal Lee episode. It's another solid life lesson episode, this time about anxiety. You cannot beat it through lucky charms and avoidance patterns. You have to consciously catch yourself and face it head on. It won't magically fix it, but it definitely helps. Boruto really out here being strangely progressive, so I guess go Boruto? Mitsuki's disappearance arc. Finally, a long arc where almost everything is allowed breathing room and development time. This is very much a classic sci-fi story dressed up in Naruto clothing. The idea of artificial beings questioning what it means to be human and whether their will is truly their own or a fabrication like their existence is as old as time itself. The arc doesn't offer anything particularly new in this area, but it takes that basic concept and elevates it well. Mitsuki's unwavering obsession with Boruto has been such a recurring point in the show so far that I was wondering whether that was just his character or if there was more to it. I'm glad the latter was the case and I think creating that contrast between a baby bird associating its first interaction with a parent was a very neat way of not only establishing the mental dominoes falling in Mitsuki's mind but also explaining that concept to younger audiences. While this arc is largely disconnected from the previous one beyond the white Zetsu link in its finale, the character growth established last arc is plain to see. 
Boruto has never felt more like Naruto than in this arc, and yet he's still distinctly his own character. There's this sense of understanding his father's own relationship with Sasuke, particularly in the scene where he delivers one hell of a momentous speech to Orochimaru. He will not give up on his friends, and he entirely rejects the notion that Mitsuki is a replaceable construct, one of the key themes of this arc. Following these initial establishing themes, the show takes a pretty interesting turn by leaning very heavily into Japanese mythology with the Snake Sage and the ensuing trials. After Shippuden pulled away from that, focusing more on politics and grand battles, it is pretty refreshing to see those elements back. While I greatly enjoyed the interactions with Garaga and the summoning contract sections that play a larger part later in the arc, I think the actual trials themselves are pretty underwhelming and by the numbers. There's very little thought needed to overcome them, and their purpose is immediately obvious from the get-go. That's not all that satisfying to watch when you know immediately where things are going, so it just ends up feeling like a drawn out detour. On the flip side, this first act spends a lot of time introducing the characters that Mitsuki's with, and who ultimately serve as the major antagonists of this arc. I don't think I could have asked for much more here, this is everything I've been wanting since the show began. Each and every character here has their own distinct personality, motivations, and perspectives on who they are. Of course, the major focus is on Sekie and his friendship with Mitsuki, which ultimately ends up being one of the strongest parts of this arc by a landslide. The scene where they discuss death, crying, and other various aspects of humanity is some of the best TV the series has offered so far. Over in the Hidden Stone, Kurotsuchi is captured, and for some reason that bothered me the most out of anything within this first act. She's the Tsuchikage and is taken out in an instant? It really feels at odds with the established narrative and a bit of a contrived way to push her out of the picture for the following acts. There's a much needed reset coming into Act 2, with Inojin coming across a young Akuta and subsequently bonding with it, leading to that cute little blob becoming the best part of the arc by a mile. I want one, I need one, and I will protect it with all of my heart. <laughs> a major turning point comes about from revealing Onoki was the one who created these beings. While the show goes out of its way at this point to make it very clear this plan stemmed from a misguided desire to protect the village, I didn't really buy into that at all. It felt so intensely at odds with the character established in Shippuden, and even the antithesis of what we'd seen from him in Boruto already. Thankfully, my issues were entirely eradicated when it's revealed this came about due to the death of his grandson, and how he holds the most intense regret over it, believing it was largely the result of the teachings he passed on to him. That is heartbreaking and more than enough to turn any man onto a misguided path for redemption. Unfortunately, this wonderful stuff comes after a very bizarre tangent into the Sanzu Plains. The setup here is fascinating, find your heartstone in order to leave. The assumption I had, and what the show seemed to be trying to tell me from the get-go, was that this was going to be a dual learning moment for both Boruto and Onoki. The master pupil dynamic is so strong in this section, it is entirely cast aside by the appearance of Seki, who although relevant later, feels bizarrely misplaced here, taking away everyone's agency. The Heartstone becomes a relevant aspect again in the arc's finale, but ultimately all it does is make this lengthy tangent feel spectacularly contrived and unnecessary. Heading into Act 3, the narrative takes a surprising backseat, instead replaced by lengthy periods of action of varying quality. Of course, following the sci-fi formula it's borrowing from so heavily, Onoki, upon realising his mistakes, is overthrown by his own creations, pushing Ku into the main antagonist role. At this point, I had all but forgotten this was supposed to be a Mitsuki arc, and I think the show also forgot, and that's ultimately the biggest issue I have with this thing as a whole. While all of these fabrications have these intensely introspective moments about what it means to have a heart and a will, Mitsuki's just there. He doesn't really have any defining moments of his own. And while I think the point is that as an audience we're supposed to take what these other characters are saying and apply them to Mitsuki, the story is simultaneously showing us that Mitsuki is far beyond the stage of development. He's not like the other fabrications. And that's why people like Sekie ask him about these humanistic elements that they don't understand yet. That would be fine if the mystery of this arc was about Mitsuki realising that he is in fact a person with a will and not programmed. But we already knew that, the arc tells us that repeatedly, that's why the other fabrications look up to him and he even seems to know that himself. And yet all the ending really does is make Mitsuki realise that again, and in the most unfulfilling way imaginable. I think the emphasis of the arc ended up being entirely on Onoki, and as a result his sacrifice ends up being the most moving part of the arc next to Akun's death when it really should have been on Mitsuki somehow. I think the fallout and funeral were pretty undeveloped, sadly, and combined with a Genin removal fakeout, it leaves the ending feel kind of underwhelming and rushed. The show's finally got the balls to make significant, long-lasting decisions to the world, but at the same time it still isn't quite committing to it. 
Yet despite the resolution feeling rushed, I was quite ready for the arc to end. The episode count to me was right, but the distribution of episodes was wrong for its final act. Too many episodes on action, not enough on resolution. Overall, I do think this was definitely the second best arc of the show, just through virtue of its length allowing for development, but it is a little frustrating to have the show improve in areas I wanted it to improve in, only to slack in areas it was doing so well with prior. Parent and Child Day Arc I'm not sure this really counts as an arc because it's so short and not really telling an overarching story, but it contains some of my favourite episodes in the series so far. Naruto and Himawari's little adventures together is just the most adorable thing ever, and there's legitimate development for Naruto as a father, which is slowly becoming one of the coolest recurring themes in the background of this show. The later episode with Sarada and Sasuke function similarly, and I don't think I've ever laughed as hard as I did hearing Sasuke call Sarada a peanut. In spite of how hilarious this batch of episodes is, they are fundamentally character-driven and so touching. Even the recurring Shino gag says so much about that character. I wholeheartedly love this stuff and could probably watch 50 episodes worth of these old shinobi being dopey parents. Jugo arc. I wish I had some sort of intelligent criticism to bust out here, but this arc is legitimately so irredeemably horrible that I can't even begin to put it into words. There is nothing here. Nothing. No possible analysis will ever do justice in explaining why this arc is as terrible as it is. 90% of the story is spent repeating the same plot points of oh no the birds and oh no Jugo is transforming what do we do and it just culminates in a shockingly poor villain twist that largely had nothing to do with anything the arc was trying to say in the first place. I cared more about the goose finally learning to fly than literally any other aspect of this arc. Not even Dio's voice actor could save it. And what's somehow more frustrating is that this arc is really, really well animated. It is so upsetting to watch the visuals pop off here for the most painful content. If I were watching this weekly, I would have dropped this show and never come back. What the actual f*** was going through the minds when they put this together? F*** this arc. I was so ready to give up, and yet it was a slice of life episode about Mitsuki and his adorable little cat that pulled me right in because, God, this show knows how to do cute things right. Steam Ninja Scrolls arc. This is a very strange arc. Mirai is a pretty great blank canvas to flesh out. We don't really know her beyond her relationship to her father, and to do that while entirely ousting the show's main cast is very refreshing. Kakashi and Guy have been largely absent from the show too, which essentially doubles that breath of fresh air feeling on offer here. This is such a character-driven arc. Not only is this new character being fleshed out, but we're simultaneously understanding with her what her father really means to her, alongside witnessing her own discovery of what the king is. For the most part, the arc does exactly that. She's very by the book and wholeheartedly wants to do her very best in the presence of two people she greatly admires. Their interactions are a whole bunch of fun, and there are sweet moments where Kakashi likens aspects of her attitude to Asuma. You've also got more isolated episodes like the opening few, the ghosts, the cat vs dog festival, and those are all absolutely wonderful and I wish the whole arc consisted of them. Unfortunately, in its efforts to try and conjure up a proper narrative beyond these character moments, it kind of undoes a lot of goodwill I was giving it. There's this tiny drop of plot about girls going missing which miraculously leads them to a hedon wannabe and it's just the most contrived way of creating parallels between father and daughter. There's no build up, there's no development, and it neatly wraps things up within the space of a single episode. In her infinite wisdom, she somehow comes to realise what the king is. Oh, it's the future. Mirai means future in Japanese and I'm called Mirai Wow. I really felt like you weren't that. That's it. That's the arc. It's then followed by a recap episode where anything remotely exciting is off screens, and I guess Shigurai is now a tune in. Okay then, great, thanks. Konohamaru's Love Arc. If it wasn't obvious up to this point, I have zero idea what the consensus is on any of these arcs, and I'm kind of glad because it meant I could approach everything with zero preconceptions. That said, just because I know anime fans and I kind of know the Naruto fanbase, I can make educated guesses about what will and won't be liked, and in this case I sort of get the feeling this arc might not be popular in the larger community. I actually really liked it though, it reminds me of the type of thing you'd find in a side quest in The Witcher 3, there's a curse or a monster, village politics, romance and action. At such a short length, the writers 100% managed to get me on board with Lemon and Konohamaru's romance and the villain standing in their way, while establishing plot points and themes that resulted in some pretty significant significant emotional impact by the time the finale rolled around. In particular, the lemon burger scene which on paper is the most absurd thing ever, but I felt legitimate emotion from it somehow. I got emotional from a burger and you are more than welcome to believe me but I thought it was great. I was so 100% on board and happy with what this short little side adventure had to offer. Maybe my expectations were skewed after the painful quality I just suffered through with Jugo, but I had a great time with it, I really did. One Tail Escort Arc in many ways, this is exactly what I was after since the Momoshiki arc, but it's also the perfect demonstration of everything wrong with the Boruto anime. 
Boruto heading after Sasuke and wants of more training, running into him and Gara in a confrontation with Urashiki, then thrown into a mission where he's forced to work with Shinki to transport Shukaku, while evading the enemy is almost point for point the type of continuation that just makes sense following the events of the movie arc. The rivalry between Boruto and Shinki develops and they learn from one another, there's a name drop for Boruto's eye power and a whole bunch of character moments that feel super relevant. It's also neat to see the politics of the Sand Village on display of either father and daughter in the wilderness, and the way that's looped back into the story is satisfying as hell. The issue, and it's one that plagues almost all of Boruto, is that there can never be progress or significant change for certain generations of characters. The format doesn't allow for it. Urushiki cannot kill Tamari, Shikidai, or Kankuro. If they're alive in future content in the manga, the anime cannot change that, so these moments of drama where they're zapped of their chakra but not quite enough to kill them feel very contrived, particularly Kankuro's death fake out has kind of swept under the rug once the arc ends. Likewise, Boruto and Shinki obviously cannot die, but they also can't defeat Urashiki right now because one, it's a bit too soon, and two, they're just not powerful enough. Sasuke can't get involved or there's no room for the main characters in the story anymore, and as a result, you end up with this awkward contrivance of him having no chakra left to actually do anything. Likewise, Urashiki has to simply be toying with and holding back against Boruto and Shinki to explain away the reason they're not obliterated in an instant. You can't just have them do nothing either, so you have these bizarre scenes where he's almost bested by simple sealing jutsu and clone fakeouts. That is, of course, until it's Sasuke's time to pop back up into the story to save the day, leaving Urashiki to zip away because it's not actually time to finish him yet for some reason. I still found myself enjoying this because it's a legitimate continuation of aspects laid out at the end of the movie arc. I love anything that feels like it's it's connected to previous stories, but it's just incredibly hard to ignore these obvious issues. The content itself is largely interesting, but it still feels hollow because nothing is allowed to progress. I love the dynamic between Shinki and Boruto, and once again, I can't wait to see more of that. But I need something that's a little more than just a smidge of progression. There's some great ideas here, but they need to be set free. This arc ends on a major high note at least, Himawari and Shukaku's episode was pretty much the perfect way to wrap everything up. They're adorable, and if I'm being honest, I kind of want to turn Himawari into a donut and devour her because she's so cute. Time Slip Arc I wasn't particularly for this arc's concept going in. The show up to this point has been largely staunch in its mantra of, this is Boruto's story, so on paper, it seemed as though it was dropping all of that for a trip down memory lane for the sake of unabashed fan service. I pictured a strange Dragon Ball Xenoverse type story where you zip through and relive the series' iconic moments just through the lens of a new character injected into the story through time shenanigans. This arc isn't that, but it is functionally playing out with the same intent. I was worried the introduction of time travel would feel incredibly jarring and a strange cutaway from the main Urashiki threat that finally reared its head in the previous arc. Thankfully that wasn't the case, Urashiki and his motivations are tied irremovably to the concept of this arc, and that went a long way in helping to actually invest me in this time tangent. The arc does a lot of right with its character writing, Naruto and Boruto's interactions feel perfectly natural, and I think the conversation they have in Naruto's bedroom at the start of the arc is a perfect example of that. Similarly, Sasuke's conversation with Naruto a few episodes later about not giving up on friends is pretty touching, if kind of wink wink nudge nudge towards the audience. That's about as positive as I can be though. For me, this arc is a total and utter disaster and it is saved entirely by virtue of not being boring. That is all it has going for it. Up until this point, because I hadn't read the manga yet, I was entirely convinced Urashiki was a manga character. He would crop up and vanish in neat little bow tied arcs that almost seemed to be screaming, hey don't forget about this guy, we don't have manga content to cover his story yet, but he's important, okay, so don't forget him. And that was largely fine with me because I was so sure there was a fully fledged Monoshiki scale arc waiting for Urashiki down the line. When he popped up yet again in this arc, I was beyond confused how they could possibly drag this character out any longer. Well as you guys know and as I do now, particularly after reading the manga, he's anime only. That is mind-blowing to me. With all the freedom in the world, these two arcs were the best they could come up with. I was legitimately astonished. I was so willing to write off the contrivances of Sasuke's nonsensical chakra drain and Urashiki's I'm holding back attitude last arc, entirely due to the misconception about this character's source material. With the truth in mind, that doesn't cut it any longer. It is beyond all logical comprehension to push Sasuke out of the story like this, and it is even worse to have Urashiki actively struggling in a battle, only to go, well, I can easily find you, but I don't want to waste my energy when the heroes vanish and he's at a disadvantage. I don't envy having to write a narrative around a character who possesses every power under the sun when the hero of the story is barely even a blip in the grand scheme of things. But none of the solutions here work or make for compelling storytelling. It is blindingly obvious they were so clueless on how to beat this character given they just rehashed the ending of the Boruto movie. 
only for it to not actually make any sense, because Naruto is a child and not even remotely as strong as his adult counterpart that was critical in making the movie ending make sense. It brings me no joy in being one of those, the power scaling is dumb people, but this is not even that. This is basic narrative progression being ignored here. This is just straight up bad writing. The fact that this is seemingly the end of Urashiki's character, it's so unbearably painful after all of that build up and anticipation. What a colossal waste of the one through line keeping me, and I imagine a lot of fans remotely invested in the overarching narrative of the Boruto anime up to this point. Even episode 135, the most well-animated outing this show had seen in dozens of episodes, felt underwhelming because of such piss-poor writing. It left me so disheartened and I am so curious to find out what the general consensus is on this arc. Part of me is so worried people were caught up in the nostalgia but I so pray that isn't the case because god to me, the issues just seem so plain as day and I do not want to be alone on this. Mujina Bandit's arc for a bit of background, Blood Prison is by far my favourite Naruto movie, so to have an arc centred around that same concept was super exciting to me, particularly with its relevance to the upcoming manga content. Prison drama is always so much fun, and I'm glad it managed to deliver near flawlessly. The initial episodes featuring Boruto and Ko learning about the inner workings of the prison were great, there's something so satisfying in watching the politics of the prison come to life, and having Boruto prove himself to bigwigs in aid of information, while Sorida investigates from a totally different angle. At the same time, the prison characters themselves have their own story to tell, primarily the contentious relationship between the master of the prison and the chief officer that binds itself firmly into the overarching narrative. Every new character is exceptionally well written. Kokori's fear feels well realised and his backstory is compelling and sympathetic. Kamata's front versus his family driven motivations are great and makes the position Benga puts him in later in the arc all the more effective. Likewise, the nuances of Kidama's story are incredible and easily my favourite aspect of the arc. It sure helps that he's voiced by Kirihu's voice actor from Yakuza, I just want that man to narrate my life. The weakest part of the arc, the mystery of who attempted to stab Kokori, isn't all that bad either. While there's absolutely zero doubt about who did it from the very moment they showed the painfully obvious silhouette of the attacker, Arai himself is a pretty neat character regardless. The looming threat of the arc Sukiyo felt a little understated for much of its runtime, but the final fight was satisfying enough and ultimately, the highlight of the arc, the big twist, renders any issues there totally moot. What a turning point that is, the balls, the killer for character the audience spent so much time rooting for that the heroes were convinced they saved is fantastic and 100% the type of compelling writing this series needs more of. The way that ties itself into the manga content that follows is wonderful. What was originally just a small time villain to build hype for the husk is now a legitimate threat with a personal tie to the main characters. With that firmly in place and the incredibly touching relationship between Tento and Boruto established, the battle that ensues to wrap up this segment is phenomenal and easily the most emotionally satisfying content since episode 65. Ken Yamamoto's scene blew my face off and I think I'm going to have to learn Shojiji's Jutsu if I have any hope of regaining one again. Wrapping things up with a gigantic tease for Boruto's palm mark and his upcoming organisation is really just icing on the cake for such a strong string of episodes. The Himawari filler that follows is wonderful too and some other Team 15 content I typically despise more than anything on this planet is likewise pretty good. The show has been on a real hot streak throughout this batch of episodes, and with it looking to head into manga content next, it seems as though it will continue, which should be so exciting for fans who've stuck with this show. Conclusion Overall, the Boruto anime is a real struggle to process. On one hand, it has such a wealth of wonderful new and fleshed out characters that cannot be ignored. It is so set on being its own show, and I think by and large it does that successfully. This is absolutely not Naruto, but it does feel like a natural evolution of that world and I can only commend it for that. I love the three main characters, I love the new Inoshika Cho, I love the, the other classmates, as mixed as I might be on them, are fleshed out enough to feel like organic parts of the world. Almost nobody feels like a carbon copy of their parents and that was definitely my biggest concern going in. On the other hand, the narrative and particularly the structure are legitimately abysmal and they hurt the show to such a degree that not only do I now understand the show's overall reputation, but I can't really blame anyone for dropping it or possessing these negative feelings. Almost nothing matters and there's no progression, no stakes, no overarching narrative to tie any of this content together. It is a segmented mess full of incredible highs but far too many dreadful lows. You could safely remove a good 75% of this show's content and lose nothing of worth. 
Almost no story arc offers plot points that have any real effect on the world. Almost everything is always tied up neatly in a bow and brushed under the rug before moving on. Anything with real potential, or Ishiki in particular, is squandered. I have now caught up with the manga and I have to say I am wholeheartedly in love with it and just astonished by how authentic and consistently written it is. It feels wrong to review it in the same way I've reviewed the anime so far because while you could certainly break the story up into little arcs so far, it's written in a way that is 100% one long story. It is the opposite of the anime segments. It takes the concept of scientific ninja tools and Momoshiki's final words and leans into it so heavily to tell such a compelling story with wonderful characters like Kawaki. The husk, Kara, feel like a legitimate threat with interesting motivations, and as of the recent few chapters, it's beginning to take poorly fleshed out aspects of Naruto's ending and retroactively make them better. I don't think you could ask for much more from a continuation of such a beloved series. I think where it does falter is where the anime shines and that's in its side character development. The manga is 100% focused on Kawaki and Boruto and that does make sense for the story that's being told right now. But presently, Sarada, Mitsuki, Inoshika Cho and the countless other characters range from paper thin to largely non-existent. Despite appearing, I'm not sure Metal Lee was even named for example. The manga has the superior narrative by an absolute mountain mile. It just needs to step up on the side character side of things, which to its credit, it has definitely been doing a lot more lately. On the anime side of things, it needs to step up its overarching narrative, and similarly, it does seem to be doing that too. The prison arc being so great and leading into manga content was very fulfilling, and the fact we're now looking to adapt this wonderful husk stuff should help a lot. If it stays that way, with its ability to tie plot points together, then I imagine I will probably stick with it. But if not, and we fall back into these lengthy sections of uninteresting, segmented side stories, I'm not convinced I'll stick with the show. Presently, the manga is where my priorities are, but I'm curious to see what the greater fandom thinks. Please do let me know in the comments section down below what your thoughts are on the anime and the manga. Maybe you disagree with me on something, or maybe I've missed something, or misunderstood something somewhere. By all means, please let me know, I'd love to hear. As always, be sure to rate the video if you liked it, subscribe if you're new, and I will see you next time.